One, One second. second. I just got to grab the clicker. All right. Good evening. Um, I picked out this verse tonight that uh, David just read for us, Philippians chapter 3. Um, originally, I was thinking verses 13 through 16, but as I pulled up my copy of God's Word, I was like, you know what? We need to start in verse 12. Um, because Paul is talking here about uh, striving towards the goal, sh- striving towards the goal of of obeying Christ, of following Christ, of, of walking a, a, a walk that is glorifying to Christ. And, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. So it's going to be five things to pursue in our walk with Christ. Five things as we, we look forward to the future, as, as we look in our own lives, as we look in the life of the congregation, as we look in the life of, of the kingdom of God, the church as a whole. Uh, five things to pursue as we seek to to walk as though Jesus is walking through our own lives. But before we do five things to pursue, I actually want to go back to five things uh, I want you to remember. This is a class that I did with the teens about a month ago. Um, And and it's just simply, if if you don't remember anything else from what I've taught you over the past few years, I want you to remember these five things. So I want to go through this real quick because the, the, the main part of the lesson that I want to teach tonight is the five things to pursue. But it is really beneficial if we look back to the five things to remember before we go to five things to pursue. Number one is study the word for yourself. This is something that um, I, I know I have tried to ingrain into the teens over the past few years, and hopefully it's something that, that everybody has heard, but it's study the word of God for yourself. You know, Acts 17, 11 is one of my favorite passages, um, but it's where uh, Paul is going through Thessalonica, and the Jews there don't have anything to, to do with what he's, uh, what he's saying. And so then he goes on to Berea, and it says in verse uh, 11 of Acts 17, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They wanted to double check what Paul was, was telling them. Paul is an inspired apostle. He, he wrote the majority of the New Testament, and yet still the church in Berea was like, mm, let's see what you what you're saying. It, is it really true what you're saying about Christ? Let's go back to, to Scripture, the, the Old Testament Scriptures that they had at the time, to look at what Paul is saying about Jesus the Christ and, and the prophecies about him proving that, that he really is the Messiah. And they were fact-checking Paul. We have to be the same way. We have to study the Word for, themselves, for, for ourselves. It doesn't matter who is standing up here. We, we can't take anybody's word for it, any man's word for it. The Word of God is is the most sold book in the world. There's more copies of this book than there are of any other book in in the entire world. And especially here in America, it's so easily accessible to us, whether it's a a hard copy like this or even on our our phones or our tablets or on our computers. The the copy of God's Word is is anywhere you look. We have to study God's Word for ourselves. We can't take anybody else's word for it. also in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, this, there we go, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, uh, Timothy is instructed by Paul to rightly handle the word of truth. Don't let anybody else handle the word of God for you, is, is what I'm trying to say. Don't let anybody else tell you what to believe, what to understand, or even what to read. Read it for yourself. Believe it for yourself. Obey it for yourself. Um, Everybody has a bias when it comes to teaching the Word of God. We have to overcome these biases so we can read Scripture for what it truly is, instead of through the lens of mankind. Um, but like I said, i got to go through these pretty quickly. So number two is always be hopeful and joyful. This takes me back, actually, to 2020. Uh, many of y'all remember uh, what 2020 is, is famous for, the, the world shut down. And I remember for about a year straight, I would set up my phone on a tripod and uh, on my kitchen table and teach a Bible class on Wednesday nights to my empty living room as I was facing the living room from my kitchen table. Because we weren't meeting here on Wednesday nights for about a year straight. And every single Wednesday night, I was very lonesome in in setting up my camera to teach on Facebook Live for anybody that, that might glean some biblical knowledge from that. We had a lot of different ways during that time for people to, to be in God's Word. Chris had classes, Dan had classes, Corey had classes in all sorts of different forms, whether pre-recorded or over Zoom or Facebook Live. 
But one of the things that I remember that I always tried to, to make a point of closing class with was to encourage people to stay hopeful and to stay joyful. Because we were in a time that a lot of people were lacking hope and a lot of people were lacking joy. But those two things are not, determining, are not determined by our circumstances that, that we find ourselves in. It can be 2020 or it can be 2024, and our joy is still found in Christ. Our hope is still found in Jesus Christ. The circumstances of our life don't determine our hope and our joy. Also along that line, joy is not the same thing as happiness. Happiness is momentary. Happiness is determined by our circumstances in life. But joy, rather, is found only in Christ. Along with being hopeful and joyful, some of the things that, that I've I've tried to teach that I, I hope you re remember um, is that uh, I believe most people are good. This is actually a country song that I've, I've really used a whole lot in a bunch of different lessons, but, but it's that there, there's good in most people. When you look around the world, even if people are lost, if people aren't in Christ, they still have good in them. And when we are able to see that good, then we are able to take them to Christ. We are able to introduce them to Christ. Um, and that's 1 Corinthians 13. You know, the, the love chapter. Um, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love believes all things, that's believes in Christ, believes God, believes what he teaches. We have faith in him, absolutely, but we also believe in other people. Um, we don't believe that people are out to hurt us. When we do that, we are, will always be hopeful and joyful. The other thing that I've tried to pass on to, to remember five things, again, that I want you to remember, if you don't hear anything else from what I've taught, is to keep your focus on heaven. This has been my favorite Bible verse since I was in high school. Colossians chapter three, verse two. I think I've taught this before as well, and I apologize that I'm talking fast, but I've got 10 points to go through tonight, five to remember, five to pursue, and so we gotta fly through them. I got about three minutes per point. Um, but Colossians chapter three, verse two has been my favorite one since high school. When I graduated high school, instead of getting a class ring, I actually got a class baseball bat um, with uh, you know, like my favorite verse, my uh, the graduation year, and all, all that inscribed onto it. Uh, but the verse that I had inscribed onto is Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. We have got to mentally get away from things that are physical, mentally be unbound by, by the, the shackles of material possessions so we can set our mind on things that are above, so we can focus on Christ where he is seated at the right hand of God. Um, I love the song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, because that describes exactly what Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 is talking about. It's not my home. I, I am not a, a, a citizen here. My citizenship is found in heaven. Um, also in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 12, um, that David just read for us, but not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on. It's something that we continue to seek after. It's something that we can continue to chase after. We've never reached a point where we say, I have arrived at my relationship with Christ. We are continuing to grow closer to him and more like him. Um, I saw a t-shirt a few months ago that I absolutely love. I think Lisa actually bought it for me. Um, I was trying to remember who got it for me, but it says um, that I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm just here recruiting. Um, and that, that mentality is exactly what I'm talking about from Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, as well as Philippians chapter 3, that, that my citizenship is found in heaven. The fourth thing to remember is uh, that you are able to accomplish more than you realize, more than you can ask or imagine, according to Ephesians chapter 3. And if you will, actually turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. I want to spend just a little bit of time on this one. And I know, again, I've taught this one um, many times, and, and so if you're hearing the exact same lesson that I've taught before, it's because I absolutely love it, and I really, really want you to remember this. But Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14, Paul says to the church in Ephesus, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. It's God's power that's at work. He's going to be the one strengthening you with power through his spirit. It's the spirit of the living God that is going to equip us and that's going to strengthen us. And then jump down to verse 20. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. I believe it's the NIV that says um, more than we can ask or imagine. More than I can even imagine 
what I can accomplish in the church, what I can accomplish spiritually speaking. And believe me, my imagination is incredible. It's like a five-year-old. I can, I can imagine some incredible things, but more than I can even imagine is what God can accomplish through me if I let the Spirit of God work through me. Um, far more than we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. That's the end of verse 20. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. When we let the Spirit of God work in our lives, we can accomplish more than we can even ask or imagine. And we actually just had a, a, a theme about this at T3 last weekend. Uh, the, all the teams were over at Louisville for a, a huge uh, conference that's hosted by the Louisville congregation every year called T3, which I know I've talked about that before as well. But there were almost a 1,000 teenagers there this year, and the theme was Imagine. In other words, imagine what the church would be like if we focused on these things. And some of the topics were love and unity and selflessness. Things that, that imagine if every Christian lived like this. This is, this is what the church is supposed to be, but imagine if we, we focused on that. Imagine if we got 100% participation in this, how effective the church could be in turning the world upside down. Um, the last thing, number five, that I want you to remember is love the family of God. Um, when you love the family of God, you're going to want to introduce your family to your friends. You're going to want to introduce your friends to your family. Um, we were doing a podcast about, goodness, almost three years ago now, uh, maybe more than three years ago now, um, and we were having different ministers on, different guests, and, and asking one simple question, why are you a Christian? And the, the answers varied from, well, I don't want to go to hell, to, well, I do want to go to heaven, to, uh, well, I'm a Christian because I was raised that way, or, or I'm a Christian because I, I don't see any other uh, viable option. This is the one that makes the most sense logically to me, that there is a God, he is alive, and it's in him that we live. Um, and so the, the options range, the answers range, but there was one answer that really stuck out to me. One of our brothers that works as a, as a minister at a different congregation, he said, I am a Christian, because I genuinely love God. When you genuinely love God, you have a genuine love for the family of God. You have a genuine love. You, you want to introduce people to your brothers and sisters. And when we have a genuine love for God, then everybody's going to know who we belong to. That's the, the commandment that Jesus gave in John chapter 13. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. This is in reference to Jesus washing the disciples' feet and showing them what it means to love one another. He says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When we love the church, when we love the family of God, because we love God, then everybody's going to see it. The other important thing about loving the family of God is relying on the family of God. When you love the family of God, they're going to be the people that you turn to. It's not going to be anymore your coworkers. It's not going to be anymore the, the parents that your kids go to school with. It's not going to be your, your friends outside the church. When you love the family of God because you have a genuine love for God, then you're going to rely on the family of God. You're going to realize that the support that you need to make it through this life comes only from the family of God. One more analogy with this, and then we'll move on to five things to pursue. When you are in love with the family of God, then you're going to want all of your friends to meet your family. Like I said, you want to introduce your family to your friends when you are proud of your family, when you love your family, when you're not embarrassed by your family. But you know what happens when you're not in love with the family of God, when maybe you're a little bit embarrassed of the family of God, when you're embarrassed of the body of Christ, the church, then you're not going to want your friends to meet your family. In fact, when weekend, the weekend comes and you say, you know, you can come over to my house and meet my family this weekend, instead you'll say, I'm embarrassed of my family. I'm going to go to your house and meet your family this weekend because I don't want you to meet my family. Do you see how serious this is and how important this is to love the family of God? Finally, five things to pursue. Now, I don't want to phrase this in a way of, you know, moving forward in the next stage of the, the history of this congregation. I don't want to make this seem as, as though it's, 
It's like five things to pursue in, in the next milestone of this church, the next mile marker of this church. Instead, this is five things to pursue for any Christian at any time at any congregation because these are five things that are going to help us follow in the footsteps of Christ. So let's get into it. Number one is seek to show hospitality. I would have to reference a sermon that our brother Dan Hantak did, um, was that about six months ago, almost a year ago maybe, um, on hospitality. Well, the best sermon I have ever heard on hospitality. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously, we are to seek to show hospitality, Romans 12, 13, to the church. We're to, to welcome our brothers and sisters into our home. Um, and I don't want to really continue more on that. Just go back and listen to Dan's sermon. It's on YouTube. He did a better job than I could explaining what it means to, to seek to show hospitality. But the thing that I really want to focus on when it comes to seeking to show hospitality is our hospitality to the lost. Because absolutely we need to be hospitable to our brothers and sisters. We need to welcome one another into our homes. But when it comes to our hospitality towards the lost, Jesus gave us an example there too. If you remember in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is at the house of a, a high priest, uh, Simon, and he's reclining at the table and it says this woman who is a sinner came up behind him and, and was, was, was crying, her tears dropping on his feet. She was wiping her, uh, her tears, wiping his feet with her hair. And Simon looked at Jesus and he, he says, not, not Simon the apostle, but, but Simon the priest looked at Jesus and, and he's like, do you know who she, who she is? If he knew who she was, he wouldn't be letting her do this. Jesus doesn't have to say a word to this woman, but he shows hospitality while he's even in somebody else's house by the way that he treats this woman, who clearly did not really belong there. You and I would, would look at this and say, oh yeah, she was out of place. You know, it's easy to look at things in hindsight and say, well, no, I'm on Jesus' side. Yeah, that's great. He was, he was loving. He ended up forgiving the woman at the end of that, uh, that passage of Luke chapter 7. But quite honestly, if we're in the moment, how many of us would look at this woman and say, yeah, she is out of place. I don't know what this sinful woman is doing here. Does she know who Jesus is? Well, what is she doing around him? And it's incredible the way that Luke paints the picture. He's uh, so descriptive in his writing, but it talks about how Jesus is reclined at the table, and the woman comes up behind him to, to wipe his feet with her hair, to, uh, to anoint his feet with oil. And at first, you know, I, I read that, and I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. So, like, I'm thinking Jesus is reclined at a table, and he's, you know, sitting in the chair, maybe tipping it back if he's reclined. And so, is this woman, like, crawling underneath his chair to get to his feet? No, the, the way that they were around tables then is, is they're almost reclined sideways, with their, their feet out sideways a little bit behind them. And so, she comes up behind him as his feet are, are sideways to the side of him, and that's where she is, is weeping on his feet. And that's where he sees her, he knows her, he shows love and compassion and forgiveness towards her. That's hospitality to the lost. When we have somebody come into our house who doesn't seem like they belong, maybe it seems like they're out of place. Okay, I'm going to let, let you know, Chris or Joshua or Dylan go talk to them because I don't know what they're here for. Is that our reaction? Or is it what Jesus would do, which is to show hospitality? a genuine love for this woman. You see, when we seek to show hospitality, we're showing the love of Christ. Finally, hospitality is service. And it's not just in your home. You see, hospitality is more than just inviting people into your home for a meal. It's more than just being welcoming to people while we're here in the assembly. But it's being a servant wherever you go. You know, I already referenced John chapter 13, but I have to do it again. Because hospitality is love, and when we show love, when we show that, that heart of service wherever we go, that's how we show people Christ. You want somebody to see Christ in your life? Then be hospitable wherever you go. You want somebody to see Jesus through the way that you live? You have to live differently than the world around you. The second thing that the church needs to pursue is energy and excitement. You know, I heard a quote from a, a preacher over on the other side of the Mississippi, and he was asked, you know, what's the, 
the biggest need in the church, like, like the church as a whole, not just one specific congregation wherever he was preaching at, but the church as a whole, what's the biggest need? And his response that I highly agree with is that we need to find a way to get out of the rut of complacency that the church is in. It is so, so easy to just become complacent, to just say, you know, I'm, I'm having a difficult time myself, that, that life is a struggle, and, and so I'm just going to be here. I'm, I'm doing good enough just to show up. And you may be in a moment in your life where, where that is what you can do, and that's fine. But we can't stay there. We can't stay in that rut. And we, I find it, it, it's so easy for so many Christians to, when they hit that, that moment in life that things get really difficult and they, they get into that rut of, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best just to get here, they find it's easy and they never get out of it. That, that rut of complacency, we get out of it through energy and excitement. Now, th this is not something we ever preach about for some reason. Like, it, it, energy and excitement within the church is rarely talked about. But in Titus chapter 2, turn with me there because this is important. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. I'll go ahead and read this for us. Paul talks about the, the kind of heart that we should have. Um, starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodlessness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works, a people for his own possession who are eager for good works, who are excited for good works. And, you know, that, that phrase good works is, is oftentimes it's, it's kind of categorized into to two things. It's Old Testament good works, like the works of the law, or New Testament good works, which is, you know, like, like giving money to people who are in need, uh, giving somebody the shirt off your back. Good works here is not just physical actions of doing good for somebody else. The zealous for good works is zealous for what is good. Zealous for the mission of God, quite honestly. He needs a people that are zealous to do his will. And when we're stuck in the rut of complacency, we, we can't be that. When we find ourselves just going through the motions, when we find ourselves that, that, that we're just content with letting other people do the will of God on our behalf, then we are seriously lacking the, the energy, the excitement that we're called for. I find it really hard to read through Hebrews chapter 11 and then get to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and not be excited about being a Christian. If you remember Hebrews chapter 11, that's the hall of faith. That's uh, referring to, uh, referencing all of the, the, the superheroes of faith, if you will, all throughout the Old Testament and then even some into the New Testament, how they did marvelous, incredible things because of their faith, because they knew that God was the one who had true power. They even faced death and they were put to death, but it was because of their faith that they did not back down from any challenge. And then we get to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it says, because we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight that entangles us. Let us not get weighed down by anything, whether it's distractions from life, whether it's um, D distractions from work or family or, or, or whatever it may be, lay aside anything, even if it's, it's a sin that's weighing you down, lay that aside. Do you see the great cloud of witnesses that's before you? Great men and women of faith that have gone before you and shown you how to live lives of faith. Because we have seen that, let us lay everything else aside. I don't know how we can not read that and say, okay, boy, howdy, I'm going to run through a brick wall for God. Because this is exciting. He has given me the power because of his spirit, not mine. Because of his power, not mine. It truly is an exciting thing to be a Christian. Number three thing to pursue is to hold to truth. Now, I put this right after the um, 
point about energy and excitement for a reason. Because it really seems like we, are either, we can either be one way or another. There are, there are churches that are very energetic, very excited, very charismatic in their faith and their belief. And it's like they just drop truth by the wayside because they want to focus so much on being energ energized and excited. They just want to be a bunch of little energizer bunnies. And so it's like, well, let's drop truth to the side because we want to focus on this so much. We have to find both of these. You can't have energy without truth because then you're, you're strained from scripture. But if you just hold the truth and you don't have energy, then you're, you're just kind of going through the motions. You're, you're almost like what James would call like a, like a dead church. If you just hold to, to truth, just what we have, and, and not let the faith work in your life and, and let that energize you and excite you to the good work of God. But to hold the truth, we have to look to John chapter 4. Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman by the well, and he's talking just a, a simple conversation about water. He, he comes up to, to this town, he sends his disciples on into town, and, and uh, then this Samaritan woman comes up to the well to draw water, and, and Jesus asks her for a drink of, of that water, and, and she's kind of taken aback. She's like, what are you doing, a Jewish man talking to me, a Samaritan woman? This, this really shouldn't happen, and, and Jesus goes on to tell her about living water, uh, about the water that he has to offer. If you take part in that, if you drink of that, you're never going to be thirsty again, and then uh, she's like, wow, I, I want some of that, and Jesus says, go get your husband, and she's like, well, you know, I, I don't really have a husband right now, and Jesus is like, yes, you're right. You've had five, and the man you have right now, you're not even married to. And she's, whoa. She realizes, you're a man of God, aren't you? She says, I perceive you must be a prophet. And quite honestly, I've, I've had this response before as I'm talking to people, not because I've told a woman that she's had five husbands and the man she's living with now is not her husband. I've never done that. But, but when I tell people that I work for the church, that I'm a, I'm a minister in the church, then I have people often respond to me, oh, wow. Like, so you're like a, a, a man of God of sorts. I have a Bible question for you. And that's what happened with Jesus. She says, oh, I perceive that you're a prophet. Answer me this. The Samaritans say that we're to worship on this mountain. You Jews say that we're to worship in Jerusalem. What is it? And then comes John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus says it doesn't matter the location where you worship. What matters is the heart. That you worship in spirit and in truth. You can't leave one aside has to be both of those, in spirit and in truth. Folks, we have to lead the way in that. Because there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians that have left truth aside. The church that belongs to Jesus, the church that he purchased with his blood, the church that is of him, the church of Christ, has to lead the way in this charge to worship in both spirit and in truth because there's a lot of people who do not know what that actually means to worship in spirit and in truth. You know, there was, there was a church. Uh, have I told you all about the Kentucky Fried Church? Okay, I didn't think so. Um, there was a church in Kentucky that's been named the Kentucky Fried Church um, that was dying on the vine. They were, they were struggling. They were really suffering from that rut of complacency. Uh, nobody was, was energized. Nobody was wanting to work. And nobody, nobody was really doing anything. They were a solid church, don't get me wrong, but they were just stuck. They weren't moving forward. They weren't growing. And so they came up with an idea. They said, you know, this coming fifth Sunday, we are going to have a, a potluck. And we're going to go buy a bunch of Kentucky Fried Chicken, some KFC, and provide it for everybody. And everybody be sure to invite a friend this Sunday. And we can entice people to come by saying we're providing Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's a great idea. And they saw a, a pretty good number. Um, not everybody invited a friend like they had hoped, but there were quite a few visitors there on that Sunday when they decided to have a fifth Sunday potluck. And they said, wow, this was a, a great turnout. We really see the benefit from this. Let's do this again next fifth Sunday. So four months, uh, three months down the road, um, I think fifth Sundays happen every three months. <laughs> next fifth Sunday, um, 
they decided to have another potluck and, and go purchase a bunch of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and they bought a few more buckets than they did last time because they are expecting it to continue to grow, and, and they told all of their members, invite a friend, and, and so they did, and they saw an even greater turnout, and it was really going well for them, and they said, you know, after this, this second time of having uh, this fifth Sunday potluck, this has been so good. The fellowship has been amazing. We need to do this more regularly, and so they decided to do it the, the first Sunday of every month, not just wait for a quarterly uh, this Sunday, but every single month. Let's do it 12 times a year. And they would go out and purchase a bunch of Kentucky Fried Chicken, provide it to everybody that invited friends, and they would have a great fellowship, and they continued to grow. And it got to the point where they said that once a month is just not enough. This fellowship is fantastic. This fellowship is too good. We need to be doing this more frequently. And so they started doing it every single Sunday. They would go buy a bunch of Kentucky Fried Chicken and bring it and have a potluck after services. And it got to be known across the community that this church provided lunch on Sundays, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and everybody would flock there and gather together. But you know what happened? They got too focused on putting people in seats and not on the truth of worship. There was a mindset that, that shifted from the audience of worship being the creator of the universe to the audience of worship being the people that were sitting in the pews. See, they left truth by the wayside because they wanted to pursue this, this exciting and, and energizing fellowship that they were able to enjoy together so much to the point where they made themselves the focal point of worship. You see, we cannot be a, a church that, that dies on the vine with no energy, no excitement, stuck in the rut of complacency, but we better not dare fall into the trap of the Kentucky Fried Church. They're a, they're a large community church now in Kentucky and still growing and, and still doing well because when people come, it's all about them. And unfortunately, we live in a culture that just encourages that, that just nourishes the idea that everything is about you. How can you be happy? How can you be made to feel good? And when that happens in the assembly, it's far from truth. It is possible to be filled with energy and to hold the truth. We have to find that. And we have to lead the charge in our world today. Finally, oh, not finally, this is number four. Um, to the fourth thing to pursue is unity. I absolutely love the song that Dan led. One heart, one mind, one soul to praise you. We are the body of Christ. Man, that's one of my favorite songs. Um, when you brought that up into the singing class a few quarters ago, I was like, oh, this is great. We're going to sing this all the time. It, it's a, a fantastic song. But, but that unity that, that we are doing this together, not we are the body of Christ, not we are the body of Christ, but we are the body of Christ. And we're unified in that. You know, unity and humility go hand in hand. You cannot be unified unless you are humble. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. Uh, please turn there with me also. Um, every so often I'm just like, oh man, this is a good one that I don't want to just explain, but I want to actually look at in the word of God with you. But Romans chapter 9, verses, sorry, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. When you look through that, that passage is entitled Marks of a True Christian. Um, it's something man has put in there later. It's not an inspired heading above that paragraph, but it's a very fitting description of the paragraph below. These, these are marks of a true Christian. These are things that a true Christian does. But I want to, as we read through this, I want you to notice how many of them are tied to humility. Because there's only, I think, like one or two that actually come out and, and, and talk about being humble. Not, uh, it's in verse 16, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. But there's from my count, 12 different um, 
instructions in this one passage that are directly tied to humility. Number one, let love be genuine. How are you going to genuinely love somebody else unless you're humble yourself? Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Again, love is directly tied to humility. Outdo one another in showing honor. How are you going to show honor to somebody else and, and go above and beyond in that showing honor unless you are not seeking it for yourself? A humble heart is one that does that. Um, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in the spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints. That's another tied humility, that, that hospitality mentality, and seek, seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. How are you going to do that unless you have a humble heart? Because a prideful heart says, do you know who I am? How can you be, be talking to me that way? But if you're going to bless those who persecute you, you're not looking for your own gain. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. That's a humble heart again. If you rejoice with those who are rejoicing, that's because you're focused on what's good in their life, not on what's happening in your own. That's a heart of humility that's able to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. If you weep with those who weep, that's because you're concerned about what's happening in somebody else's life, not what's happening in your, in your own. It's a humble heart that rejoices with those who rejoice and weeps with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Humility again. How are you able to, to live as one, to live unified, live in harmony together unless you are humble. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Again, humility. A prideful person is wise in their own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. A thoughtful person that is, is thinking ahead of time about how to give honor, how to do what is honorable, that's a, a humble heart that is, is looking to others and not to themselves. If possible, so far as it depends on you, because we can't control other people, but so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Again, that's a humble heart, because that one line of, if possible, so far as it depends on you, means sometimes you're going to have to put away the thing that, that you're upset about. Sometimes, sometimes you're going to have to put away the thing that you are excited about. Sometimes you're going to have to put away the thing that you're just passionate about, the thing that you really want to talk about. If you're going to live peaceably with all, if it depends on you, you have to put away your own wants and desires so that you can find peace with your brethren. This past weekend, um, Unity was one of the points from the keynote speaker at T3, and he gave a better analogy of Unity than I had ever heard before. And I want to do the same thing with y'all tonight, actually. Um, we're going to sing a song here real quick, and then I'll finish talking about humility. The song is entitled Someday. Um, I know that teens know that one. Everybody else knows Someday, right? Yes? Okay, cool. <laughs> I just want to make sure. I was like, I know I like the teens sing it all the time, but I wasn't sure about everybody. So let's sing this real quick. Um, Joe, do you mind flipping through those slides as we sing, and then I'll pick back up on the clicker once we're done singing. Uh, it starts with sopranos, adds altos, then tenors, and basses, drops out each part one at a time, and then we all come back in together uh, to sing as the song closed. Um, all right, sopranos. Someday, someday. Someday. Altos. Peace and joy and Tenors. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Some faces. Well, I gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Well, I gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Well, I gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Peace and joy.
Well, I gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Gotta be ready when he calls my name. Someday. The, the point that I want to show about this with unity, we are all singing not only different notes, but different words at a, a different pace than other parts are, and yet we're unified. It works if we want to use for the song Magnificat. It works if we want to use the song The Greatest Command. Those songs that have the four-part harmony where, where people come together as they sing is, is absolutely incredible. But the reason that we're unified is because we're all going back to the same song leader. We're all going back to the same, same scream that we're looking at to, to stay on the, the same pace of the song. You see, when we, before we sing those songs, we don't say, okay, tenor's over here, this is how the song goes. Alto's over here, this is how the song goes. Bass is over here, this is how it goes. Soprano's back there, this is how it goes. Instead, we, we have the words on the screen, there's a song leader that's always up here every time that we have a worship service to, to keep people on track as we go throughout the song. But we're unified because we're all looking to the same person and the same screen. And y'all, I have to tell you, this is so important, but we are unified when we're all looking to Christ. That, that's the point of this analogy. And I know it's, it's, it can be kind of cheesy when we're using just a, a song like that and and, and using the screen as in, in reference to that. But if we really want to find unity in the church, and not just in the Keller Church of Christ, but in the church throughout the world, if we want to find unity, we're going to find that when Jesus is our priority, when we're trying to align ourselves with Christ. You see, what really happens a lot of times is, is good Christian people will say, I want to seek out unity. I want to find unity. I want to, to be unified. And so they go to their brothers and sisters and say, let's find this unity. And they very well may find unity with a handful of people. But it becomes a click, and it ostracizes the rest of the congregation. And that's the furthest thing from unity. It comes from a good heart. It comes from a heart that says, I want to find unity. But when you're seeking unity by finding other people and not by going to Christ, then you're never going to find unity. You know, that actually goes back to humility. Because a humble heart will say, I'm not going to seek my own way of, of unity. I'm going to follow Jesus' way of unity. When brothers and sisters say, let's meet at the cross, that really is where unity is found. The last thing, I already said that. Um, the last thing to pursue, and I'm sorry, my voice is going out, um, is Christ. I think this one should be rather obvious. If we're pursuing anything in this life, anything in our, our walk as a Christian, it's to pursue Christ himself. But the first part of pursuing Christ is pursuing his church. I put this up on the screen, but it may be too small, so I want to go ahead and read what I wrote on the screen, because I think it's important. If you say that you love Christ, but you make the body, which he purchased with his own blood, a low priority on your priority list, are you really pursuing Christ? I'm telling you, this is a message for every Christian to listen to and to pursue. Because that complacency mentality, mm, it comes in right here too. You know, there's a lot of times where we excuse ourselves from the body of Christ, from the assembly, because there's something in life that's going on. How often do we excuse ourselves from something in life that's going on because of the assembly and because of the body of Christ? Honestly, like, if we're 
making something else in life a, a higher priority than the church that Jesus died for, how much are we pursuing Christ? I mean, we're absolutely pursuing him while we're here, but, you know, something else comes up. I got to pursue that. I'll pursue Jesus next Sunday again. But also, we have to pursue our commitment to him. If you will, turn to Matthew chapter 16 as we close out these thoughts from this evening. Your commitment to Christ is more than just showing up on, on Sundays. It's a daily taking up your cross and, and carrying it. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? You know, what's the word out there? What, what are people saying about me? And his disciples are like, well, you know, some people say Jeremiah, some people are saying Isaiah, or maybe one of the prophets. And, and Jesus says, okay, who do you say that I am? And it's Simon Peter that speaks up in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, that's the commitment I'm looking for. That's the confession. That's the statement that I'm looking for. The belief that Jesus is the chosen one. He is the Christ, the Messiah. He is the son of the living God. You know, within the same conversation, we jump down to verses 24 through 26. Between that, Jesus is telling them, hey, don't tell anybody about this. I'm going to be going away. Um, he, he talks about his death. Simon takes him aside and, and tries to rebuke him, and, and Jesus says, no, you, you don't understand. You, you're, you're not hearing me. And so then we get to, to verse 24. And that's where Jesus talks about, you know, if you want to, to follow me, it's not going to be a fighting for this life. It's not going to be a fight for any physical kingdom here. He says, if you want to follow me, you're gonna take up your cross just like I'm going to do. He spent the time between Peter's confession and saying take up your cross by talking about how he's going to take up his own cross. And then he concludes by saying, you gotta do the same. If you really believe what you confessed, Matthew 16, 16, then you're gonna do what I do, and that's take up, your, take up my cross. Jesus is is telling us, if you want any part in me, you, can, you can't have any part in the world. That's what the church needs to pursue. When we make that confession in the baptistry that I believe that Jesus is the, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that he died for my sins, that's not a one-time confession. That's a lifetime of saying, every day from now on, however many hundreds or thousands of days that I still have left in this life, I'm going to be taking up my cross. I'm going to be living as though Jesus is living through me. That's the last point of this lesson, but that's the most important point that we can ever hear from the Word of God, that we need to pursue Christ above anything else that Satan tries to distract us with. You know, going back to five things to remember, that idea of, of if you don't hear anything else from what I've tried to teach you over the past couple of years, please hear these five things. If I don't have a conversation with you again on, on this side of heaven, which I really hope I do, please come visit us. We plan to come back. I mean, Riley's going to be growing. David and Lisa got to see her at least. Um, but if we don't happen to have another conversation this side of heaven, please hear these five things that we need to pursue as some of the most important things to pursue in this life. You know, we always offer an invitation. Sometimes it's fitting for a sermon, sometimes it is not as fitting for the sermon, but tonight we're still gonna offer the invitation for brothers or sisters that need prayers to, to write something in their life, to, to correct a way that they have been walking, to, to repent of a sin, or if, we have somebody here tonight that's saying, I want to make that same statement that Peter made. I want to start my walk with Christ. I want to pursue him for the rest of my days. There is not a better time than right now. So whatever your need may be, you're welcome to come forward as we stand and sing.